Good morning, everybody, from the Museum of Native American History in Bentonville, Arkansas. I'm Charlotte Buchanan Yale. I'm the director of this amazing museum that is dedicated to braiding time. Um, we tell the story of the first people from uh, the Paleo period to the European influence, and then what we and from and also show the diversity and artistry of the first people from all the Americas, from Peru to Alaska onto the Antilles. So today we are hosting a native conversation. And what that means is that um, we always want to fill in a piece of history that maybe we have not represented. And what I love about my job is that I never know who is going to be on the other end of the phone or on the email machine. And uh, several months ago, we got an, a call from this amazing presenter we have today. I don't want to take up too much of his time because there's so many people waiting to uh, have a conversation also with him. Uh, the fabulous Evan Alvarado will be the moderator and send your questions over to uh, Drew Shukta Ravis. Um, this, um, before we begin, we again, we are broadcasting from Bentonville, Arkansas, and we always want to acknowledge the ancestral people that were uh, the first people of Arkansas, which are the Quapaw, the Caddo, and the Osage. And when you braid time, we want to honor those who have gone before us, those who are walking among us today, and those who will definitely be here into the future. And we hope we educate future generations uh, and plant the seeds of traditional knowledge that whatever your gift is and what you create for this planet is sustainable and good for all of our relations. Um, this, um, we also want to let you know, you can always come to the museum and watch this here on our nine foot jumbotron in the great room. But um, I, again, um, this section today is exploring 1650 to 1690. Drew, this is probably one of the longest titles we've ever had, eight coats, seven shirts, 15 fathom wampum, early colonial settlement and the first deeds. Um, I'm gonna let you give a little bit more of a description of what they're gonna to experience today. And I've gotta say, this is the very first time we have broadcast from the Hudson Valley and 12 degrees on your end of the world. And it's our honor and pleasure to, uh, you can learn more about Drew on our website and his, to introduce to you the amazing uh, person today, Drew uh, Schuchter Ravis. Thank you, Charlotte. Much obliged to you and the, um, the Museum of Native American History. Um, my name is Blackhorn is my traditional name. I am Pocomoke Indian Nation. I am cultural ambassador of the Pocomoke Indian Nation. And today we are talking about uh, eight sh um, seven shirts, eight coats, uh, 15 fathom wampum, uh, first early settlement and first deed. Uh, a lot of this program is going to go into what was it like during the time of the Dutch, the Swedes, the English in much of the Hudson Valley, eastern New York State, western Connecticut, um, all the way through into Delaware. So um, to start off, you know, we're, we'll go into what I'm wearing. So as Charlotte has said, I'm in the Hudson Valley right now. It is 12 degrees outside and I'm dressed pretty appropriately. So we'll start. I'll stand up so you can see what I'm wearing. So we'll start. From my feet to my head. So my feet, I have a pair of boot moccasins. So I'll show you, since it's kind of hard to lift my leg, I have an extra pair here for you guys to see. So there were different kinds of moccasins that people wore at different times of the year because this guy is a summer moccasin. It's made out of one single piece of deer skin. Um, there's many different types of ways to make them. This style is called a pucker toe, where the toe is puckered in. And the way that's done is um, you take the pieces, so how it's sewn, it's a zigzag sew, and it's pulled. And that's how you get this pucker up top. And then it's laced up. A lot of the old traditional moccasins are sewn just with leather from when the advent of needles came in, the end of the 1600s through to the 18th century. Um, you didn't see as much, uh, you, you'd see more finer sewing. This is more of an earlier style of sewing. Um, but the boot moccasin, this one's made very similar. Pucker toe with a straight center seam going up to the heel. Um, it goes up a little higher. 
So the boot mocks and what it's supposed to do, it goes up all the way through to the ankle. Um, and it's meant to wrap around. So there's different ways to make this. Some of them have what's called a vamp. A vamp is where there's a piece of leather. See, you guys can see. There would be a piece of leather that would come up this way in kind of an arch. And it would be sewn this way. And it'd be a tab of leather that comes up about to here. And it would wrap. So what it does is it makes more of a closure for snow. So in the Northeast, it gets very cold here in our winter times. You know, it can be. 10 degrees, it can be 12 degrees, it can be 20 degrees with a wind chill of minus five. It can be very, very cold. And so what the boot moccasin does, it keeps your feet dry and it protects you from snow. That's why it's tall. It protects you from snow. That's why it comes up to your heel. Um, the inside is insulated. It has woolen liners. By the time we'll go in more into this about wool, uh, by the time Europeans arrive, one of the first things that native people want to trade from Europeans is woolen cloth. It's one of the first things that native people really, really want. Um, and so this does have white wool and red wool that's inside. That's some of the earliest type of cloth that we know that's being traded in Eastern North America. Um, but earlier before wool, there would have been fur, would have been fur that would have lined the inside. Um, and how this works. So this wraps around the ankle, as I said, and it has long leather ties. And they go, they, there's a tie on either side of the boot and it goes around this way and it wraps and it wraps and it wraps and it ties around, around the center there. So as we move farther up, um, also to mention that moccasins typically were made from deer skin, elk skin. Uh, this is mentioned in a couple other, a couple documents, uh, Adrian Vanderdunk, who is a Schalt, and a Schalt is a legal representative of the West Indian Company that ran much of New York State, which was a um, New Netherlands colony. He writes in a very important book called Discovery of New Netherlands um, that the, the, the moccasins and the leggings that Native people wore were generally plain and they were made of deer skin and of elk skin. And these are dyed as well in walnut dye. These are dyed in walnut hulls. So as we move up, I have my leggings. So one thing you'll notice, the Eastern leggings are very, very tight. Um, that's one thing that really separates the Eastern from the Western uh, United States. Uh, the Eastern leggings are very, very tight and they're close to the skin. Uh, part of that is that they fit better. Uh, leggings are typically up to the kneecap. They don't really go farther up. Women's leggings tend to be below the kneecap. Uh, these leggings are made of deer skin. Um, and these would, be, you know, uh, these are typically worn in the fall and the winter time. Uh, in the summertime, natives typically just wore breechcloth. There was no need for so many clothes. It's why so many Europeans would write how native people seemed naked. They seem to be wearing nothing because in the summertime, it can be in New England anywhere from 80 to 102 degrees with humidity. Why would you wear a shirt? Why would you wear coats? Why would you wear wool in hot? humid weather. You, your museum is in Arkansas, and as far as I know, Arkansas can get pretty humid as well. Why would you wear heavy, heavy wool in Arkansas? But, um, so the Eastern Woodland leggings are typically, they're made of deer skin, they're made of elk. Uh, we know from uh, Isaac de Rossier, who was a Dutch explorer, trader. He writes in a letter to Samuel Blomert in 1626, how uh, in the wintertime, the natives on Long Island Sound were wearing leggings. Um, and they were made of deer skin, and he writes about it. But the Easter leggings are typically, they're, as you know, they're made of deer skin. They're very tight to the skin. Um, and it adds, makes it more form-fitting. It closer to skin, keeps you a little bit more warm. Um, but the leggings, what they do is protect my legs while I'm out in the forest. They protect me from burrs. They protect me from thorns, from branches. Um, same with the moccasins. They protect my feet from things that are sharp in the summertime if I'm around my village there would be no reason to wear moccasins and you might be barefoot. But um, if you're traveling and going places, you might be wearing leggings, you might be wearing moccasins to protect your feet, to protect your legs. So around my leg is what's called a leg tie. Um, this one's more of a later piece. This is more of a 1680s, 1690s style leg tie. It has folded quill work and it has 5-0 white seed beads. We know 5-0 beads are more later 17th century. Um, and they do appear in a couple of historic artifacts that are from the later 17th century. Uh, leg ties, all they do 
is they hold your legging in place. Because one thing with leather um, is that the more you wear it, it will stretch and it will become loose. Um, so what the leg tie does, it just holds the legging in place and it keeps it nice and tight to your leg. Um, leg ties are also another way to ornament your clothes. You have to remember prior to Europeans, you know, native people were limited in ways that they could decorate and ornate their clothes. You had things like on my knife sheath, there's paint, there's quills. You could take porcupine quills and sew and use those, but you're limited with colors. You know, you're limited with the colors that you can get from the land. Um, so color was a very important thing for native people. And it's one of the things why native people trade for beads. They trade for different European objects because they had so much color in them. Um, so leg ties were one of the ways in your outfit that you could show color. And so this has orange and yellow quills. Orange could be made from bloodroot. Uh, most of, from what we understand, most of the dyes that native people use came from plants and some of them were mineral, but most that I have ever read were all descriptions of plant dyes. Um, but orange could come from bloodroot, which is um, uh, which is a native plant in the Northeast. I can't remember the Latin name. Um, right now, but uh, it's a native plant here in throughout the Northeast, but it's known in my language as pukun. Um, it's a, it's a root that you can, that you break it open and the sap inside is really orange. You can cr crush it into a pulp and boil it and make an orange dye from it. Um, and it was highly valued among my tribe. Uh, I know the Powhatans um, in Eastern Virginia, they highly valued pukun and used it for dye. But, um, but those are my leg ties, as you can see. So as we move farther up, my breech cloth. My breech cloth, as you can see, is made. This is made from a cloth called duffel. This is a handwoven duffel made by Robert Gordon Stone, um, and it is a red duffel cloth. So what the what my breech cloth does? It folds over my groin. It covers my front and my back. It is secured, as you can see, with a leather belt um, that is tied to my waist. Um, and so I'll show you a better picture if that was harder to see. Here's some more of that duffel cloth. Um, duffel is a thick uh, woolen cloth. It was known to be really thick, it kind of itchy. Um, but it was one of the early trade cloths that Native people really want. It's recorded all over the place in the 17th century, both in Dutch and in English records, is for duffel, duffel cloth. Uh, Isaac de Rossier in his letter to Samuel Blomert in 1626, writes how the Siwanons and Shinnecocks in Long Island wear duffel. They wear duffel cloth around their waist. They use them as their blankets. They use them as their shawls, their mantles. Um, William Penn, in his letter to the proprietors of Pennsylvania in 1683, he writes also that the Lenapes that he encounters in Philadelphia wear duffel blankets. They wear these blankets as their mantles. He says, when the men go out in camp, they will sleep around a fire in a ring and they will use their blankets as their, as their mantles, as their cloaks, and they'll wrap themselves up in them and sleep in them. Um, Duffel was one of the most important cloths that native people were trading for from Europeans. Um, you have to remember too, prior to wool, the things that you had to clothe yourself and what we know native people clothed themselves in, and I'll, show you in a second for deer skins like this guy um when verrazano crosses into what becomes narragansett bay he writes how the native people he encounters were all wearing deer skins as their mantles rossier writes about deer skins in 1626 but also cloaks made of feathers but also duffel so deer skins and bear skins were what our ancestors were wearing when Europeans just arrived and prior to Europeans, and when Europeans came, they brought with them their whole technology of wooden, of woolen cloth and woolen technology. And one of the things that makes wool a little better than fur, when fur gets wet, when it rains or it snows, fur will stay wet and it will stay really damp and really cold. Wool has this amazing property since it's a hair, uh, it's the hair of a sheep, that it can get wet, but it will still insulate you and keep you warm. Uh, it's also fire retardant. Leather will burn. Wool will not burn. Um, so that also made it a very valuable, valuable object. Um, so duffel was one of those things that Native people highly traded for. Um, 
there was a variety of colors. Red was one color that's mentioned in a few documents, but also dark colors like uh, blue, navy blue was one that's mentioned a few is mentioned quite often. Um, Fries is another type of of duffel that's a thickly woven, uh, very th uh, uh, woolen fabric that's kind of itchy that native people traded for. So as we move farther up, I do have a shirt. It's kind of hard to see. Um, so I do have the style of shirt is a 17th century shirt because I'm wearing a coat and we'll talk about the coat since it's the name of the program. Um, shirts were one of the other things that native people traded for very, very often. It was one of the things, the first things they wanted from Europeans were shirts. Uh, shirts were being made in England and Holland and France. Um, and they would be made in these big kind of guilds. They weren't really factories yet. So there would be these large sewing guilds and they would send these shirts to North America to be worn by colonists and be worn by native people. Now the shirt that I have on is what would be known as like an undershirt. This is pretty much for Europeans, their undergarments um, and not really a nice outer shirt. But for native people, that really didn't matter to them. And these shirts were really highly desirable. They were really well liked. Um, the shirt is made of linen. Uh, linen is one of the oldest fabrics in the world. Um, and linen shirts like these were highly desirable. Uh, Native people were traded through throughout the 17th century, um, starting really around 1640s, 50s, 60s, uh, 1630s, more mantles, 1620s and 30s, more mantles and uh, deerskins, bearskins and the like. But shirts were starting to come into their way 1640s, 50s, 60s through to the 18th century. Uh, but shirts were really well liked because one, it will keep you warm in the winter time. It's an extra layer. It, it will provide that warmth. Um, even in the summertime, they will provide you that, you know, protection and warmth that will keep the, since it's linen, it's breathable, it will keep you cool. Um, but it's also a status symbol. It says, look who I trade with, look how much I trade um, and who I'm able to trade with. So shirts in that sense were status symbols. And speaking of status symbols, as you guys can see, I am wearing a coat. So the style of coat I am wearing is a 1690s style Indian trade coat. Um, coats like this, even a little earlier, 1650s, uh, they were very, very similar. Uh, this is made from um, woolen broadcloth and a linen liner. Um, the buttons are pewter. But uh, coats like these are mentioned throughout a lot of English trade documents. Now, I haven't read a lot of Dutch trade documents where coats are mentioned, but uh, Pynchon, who trades in Springfield, Massachusetts, um, the English who are living in Greenwich, Connecticut, um, and in Rye, Connecticut, mention coats over, over, and over again. Uh, coats were one of those things that are another one, big status symbol. Uh, you know, look who I trade with, look what I have. But also, it's a very useful object. It's another mantle covering that keeps you warm in the wintertime. So coats were a very desirable object that Native people really wanted. So around my waist, you guys can see, see if I can get a, is a woven fiber belt. So I'll try to turn around so you can see. Hide in the back. Uh, this is made with hemp fiber. It is a red and black design. It is made by Brittany Wally of the Nipmuc Nation, who is one of the most talented weavers, along with Julia Marden that I know. Let's see if you can see that pattern might be very hard to see. But woven fiber objects were around prior to contact and they were around in the 17th century. There are, um, there are examples of them. Uh, sashes like these were very important. Sashes, what they do you know, as you can see on my traditional clothes, I don't have a belt. It's one of the things in old Europe they had were belts. Um, but among Eastern Woodland people, we didn't have belts. So your sash acted as a belt so I could hold things from my belt. Um, so the sash also holds my shirt in. It holds my coat in. So it also keeps me a little warmer. The sash, yet again, like the leg ties, also add color to my dress. They add color and design to my dress. Um, so it adds that to it as well. As we move farther up, so as I talked about how the sash holds things in place, so you can kind of see it's holding my clothes in place, but I also have two bags. I have my slip pouch here, and I have my Apocom Parasop, my pipe bag. So I'll talk about my pipe bag here. 
made from an otter skin. Otter skin bags, we can document all the way through to John White. There's uh, the famous image of the flyer from John White's paintings, and the man has an otter skin, what appears to be an otter skin hanging from his belt. So the Apokampawasapta pipe bag was a very important object for the Eastern Woodland person. Uh, typically, the men would carry pipe bags, and they would carry tobacco bags, um, and there's a lot of images of this. Otters are an important animal. One of the traditional things that was taught to me by an elder was that otters symbolize they are a very spiritually powerful animal because they can go in between worlds. They can go under the water and onto the land. So the water is the barrier between our world and the spirit world. So the otter is a very important animal that can go in between the worlds. Um, but otters also were valuable fur that Native people traded with Europeans that are mentioned in a bunch of documents. Um, inside, you have the chamants, the tobacco bag. This is a very plain, simple tobacco bag. Um, it's made of deer skin. Uh, some of the tobacco bags that were worn around the neck were very, very ornate with lots of quill work, lots of beads, lots of decoration because they held spiritual power. Um, inside is my apokan, my, my pike. And I'll pull this out so you guys can see. So this one is carved from stone. This is what's known as a little bit of a, um, this is a typical East, you know, Eastern Woodland soapstone pipe um, in the style of a keel, though it's not a true keel. A true keel would have a bump at the end, but this is a pretty common style of 17th, 18th century. This one I carved from soapstone from Michigan. And as you can see, the bottom is highly ornate, highly designed, and it's decorated with five layer chevrons, which are some of the early type of chevrons, the reproduced chevrons. Um, and the stem is made from ash. But pipes like these were very important. This is your pipes, even in modern Native American culture, are very, very important. It's a sacred object. Your pipe is your ability to speak to the ancestors, to speak to Kashmanto, the creator. Your Tidewater ancestors. Your, your ancestors, those who came before you. Uh, this is a very important object. And young men would be allowed to use the pipe um, when they reached, uh, when they came of age, that's when they would be allowed to smoke the pipe. Uh, some of the primary sources from Virginia talk about that it was only the married men who would smoke the pipes. Um, but it was only pipe, the pipe and smoking was done for adult men who had gone through the coming of age ceremony, um, but it was something they would do when they gave thanks. Even this continues to today. You smoke your pipe when you're praying for people in your community, when you're praying for healing, when you're praying uh, for uh, you know, a good harvest, uh, you're praying for a good hunt, you're giving thanks for the animals that you took and you're, you're thinking of other people. And when you wish to calm your mind and when you, you light your pipe to help you think when you're in council, there's an excellent quote from, I want to say it was a Dutch writer from the 17th century. Um, don't quote me on that one, but I remember the quote. And the quote said, he had asked the Iroquois, because they, they were all in council and they were lighting their pipes. And they said, you know, we light our pipes for it. It helps us to think. Uh, it clears our minds and helps us to think. Um, and that's very, very true. So the pipe is very important. And one of the things besides the soapstone pipes, you know, wooden pipes native people made and they carved, they made brass and copper pipes. Brass was very common metal. You might see, an, I have a lot of brass on me and we know during the 17th century, a lot of brass was being used, cut from kettles. Native people were using European brass, but they were also trading for European clay pipes. This is a 1640s, 1650s Dutch English trade pipe. This is a reproduction. Um, this is made from clay. This would have been made in England or Holland and brought over here to trade with Europeans and to trade with Native Americans. But we find lots of clay pipes in a lot of Native American sites. But clay pipes like these were very popular among Native people. And it wouldn't have been uncommon had you met non-Christian Ogonkian people in the Hudson Valley or um, Western Connecticut or Eastern Shore, Maryland, that they would have been smoking English or Dutch clay pipes. 
during the 1650s, 1660s. As we move farther up, so I have a bunch of different necklaces. And once we finish what I'm wearing, we'll go into a quick Q&A. Um, so I have a bunch of different necklaces. So I have my neck knife. This one is an earlier style neck knife sheath that I actually made for a very dear friend of mine, Andrew Smith. Um, but I wore this one because it's a much earlier example, something that you might have seen in the early to middle 17th century. The style of knife is a Dutch style trade knife. This is made by Ken Hamilton. It is based off of a knife blade that was found in Albany, New York. Um, knives like these were very, very important. Prior to Europeans, Native people were using stone. They were chipping knives from flint. They were chipping knives from stone. Uh, even, even a lot earlier, they were taking slate and grinding slate down and making knives from those. Um, but that was during the archaic period. But we know prior to Europeans, Native people were making knives from chipping flint and chipping quartz and making knives that way. But along with cloth and along with shirts, one of the first things that Native people want from European is from Europeans are iron and steel tools. So they want knives, they want axes, they want uh, files, they want all sorts of metal goods. So knives like these were highly, highly desirable. One, because if I drop this, I can just grind it back into shape and make it sharp, um, which is very easy. Where if I drop a flint knife that's been chipped, it either breaks or I have to chip it back to shape. Um, this knife also uh, can have a very, I can carve wood with it. And I can't do that really with a stone knife. I can saw with a stone knife, but it's going to really dull it. Um, this I can carve wood. I can do a whole bunch of things with. Um, and also knives like these, you know, were being traded by the dozens. We read in a lot of documents, knives, you know, 10, 20, 30 knives are being traded you add a clip for land and for other things. Uh, so knives were readily accessible for native people. Typically in the Eastern woodlands, knives were worn in these neck sheaths, uh, known as neck knife sheaths. Um, I can't remember the word in my language for them, but um, with neck knife sheaths, there were many different kinds. Uh, they were later on in the 18th century, highly, highly decorated with folded quill work, such as this one. This is one that I wear a lot. It has, you know, two lines of folded quill work. Um, they were highly decorated. This is more of something you might see in the 1690s, something a little later. But um, the earlier sheaths are believed to have probably had a lot more paint designs. Uh, quill work would have been very, very difficult to do without metal tools, though possible it would have been very hard. So the quill work that's on here is very simple. It's very simple line work. This sheath is made out of uh, walnut-dyed deer skin that's brain tanned, um, and the quills are black and orange. And the paint design is hematite, iron ore, that's mixed with a little bit of water and grease that sticks onto the sheath. So if we look onto my necklaces, so I have a combination of both trade beads and traditional necklace. So I have this one fish pendant that was made for, my, made for me by my tribal members of the Pokemoke Indian Nation. Um, it is uh, Nitant Namis, my relation, the fish. Uh, fish for my people, Pokemok Indian Nation, we, were, we lived on the tidewater of Eastern Shore, Maryland. We lived from Worcester and Wicomico counties um, all the way down to um, Pokemok City, Maryland, which is where one of our reservations was. Uh, but the fish uh, and turkeys were our staff of life. It's what fed us. It's what cared for us. Um, and so my tribal members carved me this pendant from soapstone that we found at many Pokemon sites uh, that came from the Susquehanna River. And pendants, animal pendants like these made of stone, made of bone, made of shell were very common prior to contact in the early period. There are some examples that have survived of some of these pendants of turtles and other animals that have survived. Uh, but this one was carved for me by my tribal members. The other beads that I have, I have this string of Dutch trade beads, which are a little hard to see. Um, this is kind of what I've colloquially called a hodgepodge strand. So hodgepodge strands are, it's an interpretation of a lot of beads that we see in museum collections. Um, and these collections, and I've seen a whole lot of them throughout New York State, you'll see a strand and it'll have 
10 different types of beads that are on them in one strand. And there's a couple theories to why this is. One theory is that in the 19th century, uh, these historians and antiquarians were getting these beads and in these collections, they were trying to figure out what they looked like. And so they would just put them on a string, put them in a case and leave them at that. Um, and assumed, well, that's what they must have looked like in life. The other theory behind it that could be, and these are both, these are just theories, they are not proven facts, is that these hodgepodge strands were how they looked in real life. The reason why was when you traded with the Dutch or the English, particularly the Dutch, these are all Dutch trade beads, um, you would be trading small amounts of beads. And to make one solid necklace, you might have different types of beads to make one necklace. It took, you know, individual times you went and traded. So handfuls of beads. And so with each handful, you would start making a strand. Um, so this strand, this hodgepodge strand, kind of comp is, talks about that, where it has different types of beads that go down. And it is ornamented with, um, this is, I believe, a coyote claw that's here. Um, and it's different types of beads. But we see these types of strands in a variety of collections. These are all reproduced Dutch trade beads. I have another set of blue trade beads. Um, these round blue beads, uh, we have another type here that are called cranberry beads, which are another type of early Dutch trade bead. These ones are reproductions. They're made from recycled glass, but they look almost identical to the 17th century originals. Um, but blue and red were very important colors to native people. Blue, for lots of native people, symbolized the water, it symbolized the sky, it symbolized um, uh, the spirit world. So blue is a really important color. And we know uh, the Wendats, the Hurons traded for blue beads, particularly a lot of tribes traded for blue beads. And you see lots and lots of blue beads in a lot of the collections of trade beads that have survived. Um, so I do have one strand of just solid blue beads. I also have on my wrist and on my neck, Wampumpiak, wampum peg or wampum. Now, what is wampum? Uh, wampum is a very important object. Uh, wampum, the word derives from uh, wampumpiak or wampum peak, peak, peg. Um, it means traditionally white shell bead. Originally, the wamp, traditional wampum was made from the center column of the whelk shell was made from this center column, which would be uh, broken down this whole outer shell and this column would be ground out, cut into sections and then drilled. Um, and there's a couple collections I've seen of the original whelk shell beads, columna shell beads, and they're beautiful and they're really big. Later on, quahog shells of the quahog clam, uh, since many Eastern woodland people, we live both inland and on the ocean, we would go to the ocean and harvest these clams. Um, we would take the lips of these clams, we would break them apart from the shell, grind these down, and make, originally we made these disc beads, which I have an example here. I'll pull out. So ones like these, where there are these disc beads, or like these, that are about the size of a nickel or a quarter. Some of them are about the size of a penny. But these are kind of the really early pre-contact wampum beads that I've seen in a, you know one or two uh, artifacts that are just like these. Or these are a more modern example of what some of those beads look like. When the Dutch started coming here, they brought with them a whole world of different materials. Most of these were wool and metal. One of the things that native people were trading from the Dutch were files. Now, you might think, well, files are good for wood. Absolutely. But the native people were getting these files and they were getting these nails and they were breaking them apart. And what they would do is they would, they would sharpen down the edges of the files to make a point and they would use them for drill bits. And they would use them to drill bits to make tubular wampum beads like this guy and this one on my wrist and they would make these tubular wampum beads using european metal drills uh with stone tools it would be very very hard 
to make a tube bead uh, with a hole in it because the drill bits are very wide. So these t these tube beads got smaller uh, once Europeans brought metal drill bits. They were able to drill and make these tube beads. Uh, the last piece of jewelry that I have, I have two pieces. I have an early type of necklace that's more pre-contact, very early contact period that's made with bird bones. And these are called Dutch moon beads. Moon beads because they're these milky white beads that have this kind of iridescent sheen. We find a lot of these in native sites throughout uh, the Northeast, these Dutch moon beads. Um, but it's also ornamented with these bird bone beads that are dyed red. That's kind of, the red has faded because they were painted. Um, but this is what a very early contact period necklace might look like. And then I have a shell gorget. These were worn all the way through into the 18th century. This is made from Eastern pearl shell mussel, which was worn through throughout the Northeast. Uh, we know in Virginia, they were worn. Um, as we move farther up, I have also on my, my, my hand, I have a bracelet made from copper. This could have been made from a copper kettle that was cut and hammered. Native people would oftentimes get these kettles, such as the ones that I have here. This one, this one's a brass kettle. So it's a dog ear kettle. So we look at the lugs, they're folded like dog ears. Um, but kettles like these, native people would not only use them to cook with, but they would also get these kettles and they would cut them up and they would make arrowheads, they would make bracelets, they would make jewelry, they would make all sorts of, uh, they make pipes, they would make all sorts of metal things that they wanted. Uh, so we see kettles a lot of times are mentioned in a lot of different trade documents. Um, so on my wrist, I do have a bracelet made from copper that very well could have been cut from a kettle. But I also have on my finger a Jesuit ring. Now farther to the north, um, in what is now present day uh, Lake George, New York, and up into Canada was New France. New France was one of the largest colonies in North America at the time. Expand it ranged from Nova Scotia all the way to Mississippi. And I want to say French influence even touched Arkansas. Now, I don't know that one for a fact, but I do know that they got to the Mississippi. Um, and so one of the things that the French did that was very different than the English or the Dutch was that they were Roman Catholics and they believed that the native people needed to be converted and they really made an effort to convert the native people to Roman Catholicism. One of the things they noticed with native people is that they lived in a gift giving culture. Um, and they knew that if they wanted things from native people and if that they had to give gifts. And this was the traditional way that native people understood of uh, giving gifts and receiving gifts. And this was kind of the way if you wanted something, you would, you would honor someone by giving them gifts. So in order to get them to maybe consider converting to Roman Catholicism, they would give them these gifts of these rings, these Jesuit rings that sometimes would have the IHS symbol. They would have a cross. They would have all these different symbols. This one is an 18th century example, but it's very, very similar to ones from the 17th century. Um, but these rings have been found all over the Northeast. Um, in various native sites. And we know that native people were trading for these rings, either from the French and the Jesuits themselves, or from other native people who lived farther north who had these rings and were trading for them. As we move farther up on my face, my ears are pierced. This is part of the coming of age ritual for men. Uh, different tribes had different ways uh, that they would pierce themselves. We know Eastern woodland people were pierced and tattooed. Uh, their faces, their bodies were tattooed. Uh, typically, a lot of the documents and portraits we have are chest tattoos, face tattoos, and they had to deal with war marks. They had to deal with status marks. They had to deal with spirituality. There was a lot of different meanings that went along with the tattoos. Um, but piercing the ears, one of the reasons for it, you know, Native people, Eastern woodland people were animist in their spiritual belief. Now, what is animism? It's not the belief of animals. Animism means that everything is alive. Everything is animate. It's moving. So from the ground all the way to the sky, you are related to all of those things. And all of those things have a spirit and all of those things are alive and they're conscious and awake. And best of all, they're related to you. Um, and in that world where everything is your brother, your uncle, your cousin, you, there are, you live in the world of the Manatuniniwak, the spirit people. 
And there are good spirit people and there are bad spirit people. Now, the good spirit people want to help you. They want to make the land fertile. They want to make the women fertile. They want to bring food. They want to help you. They want you to do all these good things. But the bad spirits, they don't like the human beings. And they have lots of different reasons why they don't like the human beings. But they might try to make the human beings sick. They might try to hurt the human being, make the land infertile, the women infertile, the hunting and the fishing and the crop harvesting bad. And there were ways to get rid of these bad spirits. One of these things were to wear things that shine. Things that shone and things that made noise were old traditional ways to scare away bad spirits. Also putting holes in your ears not only decorates your body, but it was believed that the bad spirits would enter through the hole of that ear and not go inside your head or your nose and make you sick. That's why we know among some other Eastern Woodland people, they pierced their septums. And one of the beliefs behind it was that it was to stop conjuring. It was to stop bad spirits from going up their nose or bad spirits or conjuring like witchcraft for people to put bad spirits to go up their nose and to make them sick. So the earrings I have are brass. They are based off of a swallow gorget that was found in New Hampshire. Um, but we know there were a variety of different types of brass ornaments. We know from Verrazano, he talks about that they were baubles in their ears. They were all these different things in their ears. So we know even in 1524 that Native people are have their ears pierced and they're wearing earrings. My face is also painted. My face is painted in hematite, um, which is iron ore, red ochre. Um, this was very, very common. Um, in Adrian van der Donk's work, A Discovery of New Netherlands, written in 1647, published upon his death in the Peach War in 1655, he writes when he's living in Albany among the Mohawk, he says, whenever they have red paint, they wear it. Whenever they have it, and he talks about them painting up. Um, and this was a very common custom for Eastern Woodland people. It's originally where we get the term redskins, which now is a derogatory term and um, which we wouldn't use anymore, but it derives itself from early Europeans who noticed native people painted in red ochre, Eastern woodland people painted in red ochre. Now, why red? Well, red is the color of our blood. It is for some Eastern woodland people, the color of the dawn, the color of where Kuskosmat, the sun, brother sun, where he rises. Um, it is a social color. It can be used as a combat color. Uh, but typically red is a social color. It shows that I'm alive, that I'm breathing, that I'm strong, I have vitality. Um, and it was very common for Eastern Woodland people, men and women, to paint in red ochre. Um, and we know even in uh, parts of Canada, you had the red paint culture, which the whole uh, archaic period culture, uh, which I want to say is the Beothic, but don't quote me there, where they were known as the red paint people. They wore this red paint and they used this red paint in their spiritual uh, spirituality and their spiritual rituals. Um, so red was a very common color. Um, to hold this, to make this paint, I have this bag here. This holds, it has my paint, it has a mirror. One of the things we know in the 18th century is that native people were using European mirrors, which they were using to look at themselves. And actually in the 1750s, we're talking about a hundred years after that native people among, um, uh, it was during the French and Indian war and uh, Montcalm, who was the general of the French, he writes how they would put garish designs in their face, but they would look at mirrors and they would paint these garish designs in their face. So we know native people were using mirrors at least a hundred years after this timeline, they probably were using other kinds of things to paint their faces in the 17th century. But to make, mix the paint, you mix it with beer or bear fat, and you can put it in a mano shell, a white clam shell, such as this, and mix up the paint and paint your face with it. Um, and it's mixed with deer fat or bear tallow, uh, deer tallow or bear fat mixed with hematite iron ore, which you can scrape off the stone using a knife blade or a piece of flint. And lastly, with my hair and with my roach. So my hair is cut into a scalp lock. So you can see my head is shaved in that I have a singular braid coming off the back of my head and my roach ornaments the back of my head. So one of the things that we as Eastern Woodland people did, we did scalp. Um, it's an ancient traditional culture that Europeans then took from us and misused and used it against us. But originally scalping was an ancient Eastern Woodland custom. 
Your hair is a symbol of your vitality, of your strength, of your spiritual and inner health. And so Eastern Woodland people grew their hair long. Um, shaving your head had a couple reasons. One, protects you from lice, but also it gives you the scalp lock. So why the scalp? Well, originally Eastern Woodland people were known for head hunting, and it's mentioned in a variety of documents from the Pequot War in 1637, where they talk about head hunting. There's another, um, I was talking to Roger Sheehan of the Elnu Abenaki, and he told me of an instance where the Abenaki and the Mohawks were arguing, and they were arguing over the heads that they had taken in a war. Um, so we know head hunting was done. We know head hunting is mentioned in primary source documents, but scalping is too. Now scalping, taking that scalp of your enemy, because that hair is the symbol of their vitality, their strength, their spiritual health, taking that scalp is taking literally spiritual power of your enemy and owning that spiritual power. And so by owning and possessing that scalp, you literally have the power, spiritual power of your adversary at your disposal whenever you want. And so warriors would shave their heads and wear their heads, wear their hair in a scalp lock to taunt other warriors. And so I have my roach in here, which is made with dyed red deer hair. Um, the deer hair, and I'll pull this out so you guys can see because it's kind of hard to turn my head around. I'll pull this out. So the back is on leather. It is quilled, and it has wrapped quills and brass cones with deer hair. So red, number one, is a sacred color. It keeps bad spirits away. So it's one of the reasons why this is dyed red. Um, it also protects me from bad spirits trying to enter from where my plates fuse in the back of my head. It was seen that that was a place where bad spirits could enter is that seam in the back of your head. So it protects me from that, from spiritual enemies that might try to hurt me or make me sick. Um, but it's also a scalp taunt. Come and try to take my scalp. Now we know roaches like these were worn mostly during combat, during times of council, during times where they were meeting up with Europeans and talking business and doing trade deals. It was to show, you know, look how it was a peacocking, you know, look at me um, and look how strong I am, look how intimidating I am. But it was also meant to strike fear and it was also as a scalp point. So I think right now we can open up to questions since I've gone over my clothes. Thanks, Drew. Um, yeah, we've got lots of people chiming in saying they're really enjoying the presentation. Beautiful presentation. Thank and you. we've got a handful of questions. Um, if I'm pronouncing it right, Kwani asks, were the trade coast coats especially designed for trade or did Europeans wear the very same coats? Yes and no. Um, when we read about the coats, they just mentioned that they are coats. Um, in Pynchon's accounts, when he's trading in Massachusetts, he says blue coats. This one is brown, but these are identical to what a civilian coat would look like. Um, later on in the 18th century, there are Indian trade coats, and there is an example at Fort Pitt of one that was found in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, that's a red coat with beautiful gold, uh, not filigree, but gold thread. I um, mean, it was, it was fantastic. It was one of the most beautiful coats I'd ever seen. But um, these coats typically, I imagine some of them might have been made for the Indian trade. But as far as I know, document wise, it really doesn't say it just says coat. So we're led to assume that they were just civilian coats that were probably not tailored. They were a one size fit all maybe coat. Um, but coats could also be acquired in combat. You could take a coat off of a body. But we know coats are mentioned in lots of English trade documents in the middle to late 17th century. So they were probably the same as a civilian coat, probably. Um, Cynthia asks, could you talk about how the native peoples would modify the clothes sim symbolically? For, ex for instance, did certain clans incorporate any specific symbols or objects in their clothes? Um, as far as I know, the only thing I've heard about that is there's serv certain weaving patterns that have to do with certain clans and certain families. But outside of that, as far as I know, I don't know much about that. Now, it's very possible 
that that happened, but unfortunately it's not very documented. But I would imagine that there were paint designs, that there were weaving designs that did, that were family or clan specific. I want to say there's some tattoo designs that are tribe specific. I want to say there's some Iroquoian ones that are specific to certain geographical places like the Mohawk Valley. But that's as about as much as I know. I guess a little bit of follow up on that, maybe. Um, are you able to tell someone's social status by the clothes they wear or the items that they use? Where certain- oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Oh, please finish the question. I apologize. Um, yeah, were certain trade goods or clothes only used by those of certain statuses? For example, only warriors could wear certain items or religious practitioners could wear certain items, etc. Um, there's definitely objects of status. Uh, we know that sachems would absolutely have had some of the best goods, uh, especially, you know, they would have had trade knives, they would have had muskets, they would have had, you know, uh, definitely more wampum and more trade beads. Um, and these are things, you know, objects like these were more acquired through good deeds. You know, for the Eastern Woodland people, it wasn't more, you had, it wasn't more in the sense like in the Euro, European way of thinking that you're a king, so you have the most power. So thusly, that's why you have the stuff for native people. It was more the deeds that you had done, what you had done for the community, the respect that you had gained. Um, and so these things, a lot of these things were earned. But we know one of the things with the chief is that you would give a lot of your stuff away. That was to show your generosity and show your wealth is that you gave so much of your stuff away. But we know that chiefs or the family of chiefs, they might have been more decked out in trade beads and in wampum. They might have had nicer shirts. They might have had nicer trade goods. Um, but typically things that are like warrior specific might have just been roaches, um, certain tattoos. Um, and that's, I, th- I think, is, I think I've answered that question. I think that's, that's as much as more of that goes. But there's definitely higher status goods, that's for sure. Stephen was curious. Uh, he thought he saw, was there still otter teeth attached to your pouch? Teeth. The, the teeth on there are actually beads. I actually beaded. It's on there so you can see. Those are 5-0 beads that are made to represent the teeth. I was just as curious, so thank you for clarifying yeah. that. But that was the point. <laughs> Did they have the red and white war and peace dichotomy like the southeastern people did? Um, as far as I know about that, um, it's mentioned in stuff. So I've I've read some things where they talk about the white road of peace. I mean, that's more of the 18th century. Um, but as, as much as I know about that, um, red typically is a social color. Um, it's, you know, it's a color that's, um, you know, I'm not here to hurt anybody. Now there are times where I've read, especially there's one account in the French and Indian War where native people did wear just red paint and they went to fight. Typical combat color is red and black in the Eastern woodland world. Eastern woodland world, as opposed to the European world is very expressive it's it's not written down it's it's all oral it's verbal it's expressive and so you literally were to show the metaphor on your face that the light and the dark you know you have the black which shows the dark emotion that shows the anger that shows the the lack of the absence of light and you have the red which shows the light and that shows the the living breathing human so it's it's a kind of dichotomy in both those colors. Um, so we know from everything I've read is that red and black were the common combat colors. But um, as far as I know, I have read stuff about you know the white road of peace and that um, the white wampum was the was the peace wampum. Um, but that's about as far as I know about that. We have someone curious. Uh, you know they're enjoying your presentation so far, but they're curious if you do any. Uh, presentations of any other type of items like weapons or tools or things like those. Absolutely. And usually what I do is I talk about my clothes and then I have a whole blanket behind me that's kind of hard to see. And we'll go from left to right and that we'll talk about different tools and weapons. Someone, uh, Ann and Rick, ask, uh, how did you come 
to become a cultural ambassador um, in addition to giving such great talks? What are other aspects of your job? Oh, thank you very much. Um, it was a decision made last July by my our Paramount Chief, uh, Norris Howard Sr., our Vice Chief, uh, Norris Howard Jr., um, and our Tribal Council. Um, my job, you know, is to expand and to promote the message of the Pocomoke Indian people. I am the farthest north of the ambassadors. My tribes, our tribal land is in Eastern Shore, Maryland. Um, I was born up here. My family's all from Eastern, Southeastern Pennsylvania and Maryland. So I was the first born up here in 300 years. Uh, I was born in Western Connecticut and grew up in Western Connecticut. Um, and so my job is to promote our tribe, to promote our culture, to promote our interests and language, um, and to promote our presence um, in the northern northern states. Um, but this decision was made um, by our chief and by our council and vice chief um, due to my my knowledge of our historical culture, um, my years of study of it, and my dedication to my tribe, our community, and I'm also the language teacher for Pocomoke Indian Nation. Um, and so my dedication to my tribal community. Just got more people chiming in that they're loving the, the presentation. Um, do your earrings, does, does your earrings design symbolize something in particular? As far as I know, they're based off of, this is based off a gorget that was a big gorget. It was found in New Hampshire. It was made of brass. Um, and they're based off of that. These are not based off of an original, though I'm sure it's very similar original ones existed at some time, but um, they are swallows. They're supposed to represent the, the bird. And I think we're getting uh, incoming questions on Zoom and Facebook. I'm not sure that I can keep up. So in case that we don't touch on everybody's questions, um, what's the best way that people can reach out to, to, to get in touch with you or, well, or find or watch more of these? Sure. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Drew, D-R-E-W, Shupter, S-H-U-P-T-A-R hyphen R-A-Y-V-I-S. Um, and you can find me at my email, which if you contact a museum, uh, they will give you my email and you can email me there. But if you want to message me anytime, find me on Facebook. I'm there. Drew, Drew, yeah. this is Charlotte. I, you know, I know that you, I don't want to see you turn into a popsicle and we would <laughs> love to have you back again i mean this is the most extraordinary i was so dubious about you being in 12 degrees doing this and and um people have just loved your presentation and again it just uh makes us so happy to be able to share another window in time of indigenous history so is, is there anything else evan for okay because i i I just adore you and I don't want you to be a popsicle. Uh, a lot of, I want to make sure everybody knows that when this is edited, it goes on our YouTube, it will have closed captions. There is a, I am so low tech, I can't even begin to tell you, but there is a setting uh, on the bottom of your uh, computer screen that might uh, engage the closed captions when you're watching these presentations. Um, if you're not on our newsletter, um, you can go to our website to sign up. It's really important because it tells you what in the heck we're up to each month. And there's over three presentations a month. Uh, and we want to make sure you don't miss those because we try to go out virtually across the country. And um, I want to always say here at the museum, uh, we want to engage the hashtag educate, not separate. So uh, February the 12th, there'll be love letters to your family. And that will feature Bobby C. Martin. They'll be here in the museum doing collage. You can, people can sign up for that. There'll be a limited number of people. They can bring, shrink down photos and do a collage of your family. And always want to say history begins at home. So be in touch. Thank you all so much. Drew, again, before everybody goes off the email machine, I just really want to have a moment to say thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, well.